This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, and you're listening to Python's Paradise. This is your host, DJ Python Hyena, and uh, hopefully we'll have Shiloh 6 in here, but um, if not, well, I've got lots to, to float us on this interview. I have, uh, this is your film and music show. I've been reviewing films for um, since 1996, and um the film we're mainly going to be talking about today is a film that uh, w- I was 10 years old when it originally came out. I didn't see it at that age, but it's called Class of 1984, directed by Mark L. Lester. And I have the pleasure of talking to one of the stars of the film. Uh, I'll give a little background. This is a, a movie about a music teacher that uh, shows up at a... I don't know where the story's set, but I know the school's in Toronto, and he's played by Perry King, and uh, he hopes to, uh, you know, make things good for the students there, but he does not quite understand the bad rep behind the school, and he has to deal with um, a gang that seems to be um, causing trouble throughout the school, of course, led by Peter Stegman, and I have one of the gang members here on the phone, the lovely, the beautiful, the talented, Lisa Langles. Welcome to the show, Lisa. (laughs) Thank you very much. Boy, that's a way to start my day. Make me feel good. (laughs) Well, I'm going to tell you, when I first saw this movie, and I I apologize if I'm oogling, but I thought you were so hot. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I I grew up with... uh, four older brothers and so um i was they were always teasing me and so um yeah i, I to, to, to get that now it, it, you when, when people would tell me that about that movie or any other movie i, I just didn't believe them because i've been brought up by being teased by my brothers because god forgive you know you'd have you know positive esteem or good self-esteem in my family so or actually not with my family with four older brothers well it makes sense you were with four male gang members <laughs> that, that, no, yeah, that's exactly right because they wanted me for the other part of the um, the uh, student, the flute student. I can't remember her name. Erin. Erin Noble. Uh, yeah, they wanted me for her role, and that had been my brand. And you know, I didn't even have to open up my mouth to play those roles, and I was just really bored with it. And I, I, I came in and I said, "Please, can I audition for that other part?" And they said, "But we, you know, we just don't see you that way." And I said, I really can do it. I grew up with four older brothers, and I've seen them and their friends. And so I came back in, and they were floored, and I got the part. And in actuality, my character, the the biggest challenge was that there was no dialogue for me. There were no actions for me to do. So everything you see that I do with, you know, I asked for that bottle uh, to be, so I could, you know, when we were walking down the alleyway towards Michael J. Fox, I asked for a breakaway bottle so I could, you know, put it up to, you know, um, her Aaron's, neck yeah. and um, the, the 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 Polaroid camera where I say I like to watch that you know that was my idea. Um, in, in every scene, there was nothing for me to, to do other than just stand there. So I, if I couldn't find um, a, a prop, I would dance. I would find something to do because I uh, Terry Leonard, who was the uh, 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 stunt coordinator. Uh, from Indiana Jones, as a matter of fact, he's the guy who climbs underneath that stage wagon. Um, whenever there was a, a rumble, um, I wasn't included in the choreography, and it was very disappointing for me. And um, it, it had I to play it over again, I, I'd be much more assertive than I was now to say, hey, you know, I am part of this, the, this gang, and I should be active. So I just found my own way of contributing to um, the horror of each beat-up. <laughs> Well, I'm going to start you off with the most, it's going to be all smooth sailing from here, but i got to give you your most difficult question first. And it's okay. And it's one you've been asked before under extreme pressure. Are you ready? I'm ready. What's my name? <laughs> no. How many chambers are in a heart? <laughs> uh, I've never been asked that question before. I think Roddy McDowell asked you that question. <laughs> you are sharp. You are sharp. He is so I disappointed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now we have to re, re you know view review the the, the the scene. But I got the answer right, correct? 
What? How many chambers in a heart? Oh, yeah, well, he had a gun on you in the movie, so yeah, you got it right. (laughs) (laughs) But what I think it proved uh, for me that we all got the answers right is that we were free. Yes, we were free to get guns, but I think that to be the way we were and to outsmart everybody the way we were, we were actually quite intelligent people. I think, I bet you we had high IQs. I think so. I can't believe yeah. you got that wrong. I sat here and I, I, when I was preparing this interview, I was like, I'm going to ask her that question. I bet she oh, still I knows. I didn't get it wrong. I didn't answer it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a gun pointed to my head. Well, we're, <laughs> we're friendly here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Four? There you go. You got it. You got it. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. And if you hear a little bit of uh, brouhaha in the background, and my 14-year-old had a sleepover with his friend last night, and I said, okay, as of 11 o'clock, you have to be quiet. I'm doing a, um, uh, a podcast interview. And they said, uh, okay. And uh, sure enough, right at 11 o'clock, they wake up, and they're talking in the background I can hear. So that's what the background noise is, if you hear any. Is it Stegman in the gang? <laughs> never. <laughs> no, my, my, my son does not have that disposition. Has your son ever seen this movie? Uh, you know, I could ask him if he's ever seen it. Because uh, I, 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 I got to wonder, you know, what he thought of your, um, your get-up. Just a second. Emerson, uh, the radio show here wants to know if you've ever seen Class of 1984 and what, what, they, what you think of my get-up. My, uh, my outfits, how I look. He said he, said he has seen it and that he, uh, he thinks that I look really bad and that his friends all think I'm a really cool mom. There you go. You this s- is it. Like, see, <laughs> it's, it's, it's different now. Like before it was, you know, the Brady Bunch mom, but now it's the class of 1984 mom. There you go. You see, if you were my mom... You see, mm-hmm. what, what I would do, it, I, I would use this. I'd be sitting in the principal's office after jigging class, and I'd say, you know what mom did? <laughs> <laughs> they kidnapped the music teacher's wife. <laughs> <laughs> now, is this live? Because my son wants to know what radio show I'm on. It's, it's Actually, this, it's, um, it's being recorded now. I'm, I'm usually I'm live Sunday nights, but what's happening here is I'm recording this, and it's going to be put on uh, tomorrow night uh it'll be eight o'clock till uh nine o'clock and uh, that's new brunswick time that's new brunswick time so for your time it will be four o'clock okay great good i'll get him to listen to it great yeah and i noticed you you got a youtube uh, account don't you i got a youtube channel yes see if if uh, you got my permission if you want to you can put this on uh, youtube if you want Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, all all I ask is just credit my name to it, and that, that's so. That's do you it. go by uh, Gary Gilbert or the uh, Python hyena for the credit? Actually, my name's Greg. <laughs> my father's name's Gary, though. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. I say Greg. I said Greg. You, you said Gary. Oh, my brother's name is Greg. There you go. <laughs> that's a good name. That's why I remembered your name. I'm surprised I said Gary. Um, because I, I said, there's very few people that I know that, whose name is Greg. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, so you can. Really, anyway. You, you could put my real name, or and you can put Python Hyena, too. Um, okay. I have a big love for African animals, so that's where I got the DG name. Okay. There you go. Okay. So, yeah, like, um, I feel like I've known you for, like, 30 years. Cause this, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I actually... Uh, uh, have only in the last few years started to embrace that film because um, we all had such a terrible time shooting it, and it was also so violent. And, you know, I come off all these films where I'd work with legendary directors like Claude Chabrol and um, John Huston and, and J. Lee Thompson. And so to be in this kind of low-budget film that was so um, brutal, um, I kind of you know, uh, buried it for a long time, but I have so many fans now um, that come to me on Facebook, and I've watched it now. I've gone to screenings with people and um, have such a good time that I see it in a different light now. And also, I feel that the film just gets better as it ages because it it becomes more and more of a social uh, comment. I mean, at the time when we were shooting it, you know, of course, it was some fictitious 
fictitious school in the United States. And, um, you know, we just thought it was very far-fetched that you'd have to go through a, you know, a metal detector, et cetera, to get into school. But, you know, my own son, you know, uh, middle school here, I mean, he's already had in his, he's 14, he's already been involved in 10 lockdowns. Wow. He's, his, his school was right next to the Santa Monica College Rampage, and there I was at the school picnic with my son, and he happened to be in a, in a wheelchair because he'd had a surgery, and suddenly there were all these kids running across the um, the park screaming, and the teachers didn't know what was going on, and there were helicopters overhead. And for this Canadian man, that was a true, truly different school experience for me. <laughs> yeah. But we're there with that. And the other thing that was really uh, avant-garde about that movie was that um, my character had, you know, was very colorful with the makeup and the hair. And at the time, at least in Toronto, maybe not in, in, in England, uh, punkers were only wearing black and white and only had black and white hair. So... And they also used real uh, uh, extras. So I would have extras come up to me, um, and they were very angry with me because I wasn't uh, true to form, I guess, the way I, I, I should have been dressed. And they said stuff to me like, we're going to get you in the bathroom. So I was terrified. Wow. <laughs> I, I never, I made sure I was never by myself. And if you notice that one, there's a one scene where they're doing this slam dancing all the guys. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a minute, yeah. Yeah, I I, uh, I kind of disappeared there. You don't see me there. I, I uh, And no one noticed I wasn't there, the director or anyone, because I was truly afraid that they would use that moment to really get me. You, yeah. you know, it's interesting. Uh, we're going to reference that because um, the film opens with a song by Alice Cooper called um, I Am the Future. Yeah. But it's also interesting because... Um, I play Teenage Head on my show, and uh, they're featured in this in this movie. And, of course, when they're in the slam dance scene, they're singing Ain't Got No Sense. But I notice when they're going back to the, um, the washroom uh, where they're doing the drugs and they have the, the woman back there, I can hear my favorite Teenage Head song in the background, Little Boxes. And you can just hear those, ah, alimony. <laughs> <laughs> and I play that song. Every time I play it, I reference Class of 1984, and it's my favorite Teenage Head song, and I got their Greatest Hits album. Did you meet them? Uh, no, because I wasn't in that song. Oh, that's right. And in fact, what's really interesting is that um, Bathroom wasn't even at that school. It was at the, the C&E. Okay. Because we were shooting off season, so it was at the C&E. And what was really hard for Tim Van Patten is that that mirror just wouldn't break. And so he had to keep smashing his head up against it, doing the scene over and over again until it cracked. It was awful. Wow. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about the scene in the washroom during the Teenage Head concert, because I understand that that was a difficult scene for you and Timothy to do, because the, the woman was very uncomfortable, I guess. Yeah, that, that actually, that wasn't in the washroom. That was in his uh, office. So that was like a room inside that that school, and you know the school had been, you know, in the end was very disappointed that they, you know, once they saw the content that um, they let that shooting go on. But yeah, it was very uncomfortable because um, I guess this girl, uh, she was very young, and it, it happens to all of us. It's like I want to write a book about it. Um, they get talked into things like, oh, no one's going to recognize you, or the one time I did my nude scene uh, in, um, and I'm old enough that I can talk about it before. I used to like, kind of not talk about it. It was like being a, uh, a an abuse victim, so where you think it's your fault. And um, so in my film, that you know, uh, and it was because it was a studio picture opposite Steve Gutenberg, I, I believed the producers when they said, oh, you're only going to be seen in silhouette. And I said, um, I had a, and they said, nobody can come on the set because it's the big release uh, bat, uh, for 3D for Paramount, Battling Jaws 3D from Universal, and we wouldn't even let Entertainment Tonight on the set. So um, I came home to my boyfriend, you know, and because it was 3D, and you know, when I did the scene, it was, you know, like a normal set. And I said, tell me, Dave, um, if it's light on the set, but it's 3D, can, are you in silhouette? He said, Lisa, the way it looks on the set is the way it's going to look on the screen. 
and that was like one of my one of my first of many 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 times that you know I'd been lied to and I in in uh, the business and I, I see now why people get very difficult to work with they're not difficult they've been abuse victims so in that scene they they get they get the, this extra and she's just a, a beautiful young innocent girl and um I don't know what they said to her, but I was sitting next to her as they're making her up, and um, I love her makeup she, job. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. they uh, she was shaking, and I, the makeup artist was an older, mature woman, and 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 uh, she said, "Don't worry, no one's going to recognize you the way I'm going to make you up," and it was very. Um, uh, sensitive of this makeup artist to say this, but I was thinking, well, I hope nobody can because she's obviously felt she's made a mistake. And so then when we did the scene too, like Tim and I, we 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 just we have no control, right? We just have no control that that's happened. But um, we were we we felt as badly as she did, although she was literally shaking while she was doing the scene, and it worked because it looked like she was just. You know the coke head that really needed a fix, but that was actually she was actually shaking, and I, I think about that girl all the time. Yeah, all the time. Um, yeah, that's funny. So, it's it's interesting because I'm probably the only one who watches that scene. There's a naked woman standing there, and all I'm hearing is teenage heads sing little boxes. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, she's... The, the music selection was great. In, in, in fact, I run into uh, I've run into her a few times. Actually, Carol Pope, who you would know too from Canada, and is that the name of the woman? The, Carol Pope. That's from the name. Rough of... Trade. From, remember from the movie from the the band Rough Trade? They were a punk uh, band in Canada. Okay. She, she had the song "High School Confidential." Okay. Which was, you know, it went it went like this. Uh, just give me some of that high school, high school confidential. And it, I just thought it was a tremendous uh, song, and it was also Canadian for the picture. And I don't know what happened that they didn't make a deal. Um, but I went up to her when I, and asked her to have my picture taken with her recently because I'm, I'm a fan. And um, she did say, yeah, we couldn't make a deal. She said it wasn't my fault. So that's how Alice Cooper's song got in the movie. I like Alice Cooper. Don't you? I've come to like him more and more, too. Like when, when, when I, you know, in those times, I just saw it as theater. And, um, you know, you, you see now that he, he's legendary, but at the time I didn't take him as seriously as I do now. <clears throat> and he's actually a very nice guy, apparently. I've never heard any dirt on this guy. I found it interesting that um, years ago I attended a youth group. Like I come from a Christian household. And Good I, for you. yeah, and I, we were watching Wayne's World, and so, the scene where uh, Alice Cooper appears, um, Pastor leaned down. I was really offended. He said this, but he said that's an evil man, and I never saw Alice Cooper as evil. And then I find out that he's actually a Christian. I was like, somehow I kind of figured that. I didn't know that about him. Yeah, yeah he, his whole brand and marketing was about evil, and that's that's what kind of. Uh, kept me away from being exposed to him because I would I would be offended too in this whole thing of, you know, killing a chicken on stage and that was offensive to me. He so, actually didn't uh, do that. Oh, interesting. So that's just urban myth. Well, he what had happened is um, he tossed he, somebody tossed this. Uh, this is how I remember it being told. Somebody tossed this chicken or something on stage and he to- tossed uh, he tossed it uh, out. And it was the people in the wheelchairs that were ripping it apart, and that was not what he thought they were going to like, you know, toss it about or whatever, you know. But he said he was kind of mortified that that, especially people in wheelchairs doing it. Yeah, anybody uh, abusing an animal or any living thing um, is terrible. Yeah, I saw a super duper Alice Cooper um, when they played the documentary about him. Uh, they screened it up at uh, up at the mall at Cineplex. And they did a question and answer. I got to watch that live. And I, I didn't know that he had quit drinking in 1983, and he did that for his wife. And I think he's, that's a commendable. 
it's it's very commendable because um, alcoholism is 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 a terrible disease, and, and so is drug addiction. And um, they don't tell you this, but there's really only five percent of people in the Betty Ford Center who ever, or five percent of anybody who ever stays sober. Because, but they don't tell you that, so that you know you still have hope. But it's a it's a horrendous disease that affects not just that person but everybody around them. It's horrible. So good for him because. In the music industry, it's very hard to, with what you're exposed to, to, to stay sober. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but if you want to hear about music, I mean, you should talk to Mike Gormley. I mean, he was vice president of A&M Records and Mercury Records and managed all kinds of, like, the police and all kinds of, he knows Alice Cooper. And so when we're not on this call, you should... You know, awesome. I gotta send that a shout amazing. out to him because Mike Gormley, that's your manager, and yeah, but he had he you know the musicians and the career he's had in in managing people is just you know as far as American and, and and Canadian film history is just phenomenal. This is a guy that you know Janis Joplin taught him how to drink tequila. <laughs> Well, I gotta send a shout out to him because whenever um, you you um, sent me the link to contact him, he got back to me in less than twenty minutes, and I want to just say a thank you to him for um, being very upfront and giving me the information I needed, and I really appreciate it. No wonder you keep him around. Well, he he's just very new into my career because um, I've never had somebody look after me like this, and we're really hoping that with this kind of attention, he was just getting very frustrated. He knew me, and he said. You know, at least I, 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 I do music, but I just see that you have people that are inept and they're, they're asleep and not paying attention. You have all these fans out there, and we've got to get you out there again. And I've just never had anybody take care of me like this. And he's very, he gets on to things immediately, yeah. And, but I guess that's what, you know, that's what makes a great agent and a great manager great is that's what they do. They pay attention to detail. They're creative. But yes, definitely, because I, I, the reason I'm mentioning is, is you said that this is also uh, a music show, so that's why I mentioned it. Well, I, I review movies, you know, but I love playing music on here because I can't just do straight spoken word all the time. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, and, um, but anyway, because um, after we're done uh, the interview, like, um, I'm going to watch um, Class of 1984 on, uh, we're going to project it on one of the walls. <laughs> yeah. Well, if they have a new release, and we're interviewed before the. Oh yeah, I've got it sitting right in front of me. <laughs> I got. The I haven't book. watched it yet. I haven't watched the new Blu-ray release with the, um, with the interview. But I have all these films that. It, it's funny, like I said, you know, I, I work with Hal Ashby, and Neil Simon, and and Culture Brawl, and you know John Huston, and it's these other films that are getting all the attention that are being re-released, like Deadly Eyes and Happy Birthday to Me and Class of 1984. Everyone. You know, last year they had the, it was called a Summer of Fear, and three of my films, uh, horror films, were re-released. And I'm just having a really great time enjoying it with this younger generation. Yes. <laughs> well, I think the most powerful scene in Class of 1984 was the scene where Roddy McDowell loses his mind and starts teaching class with the pistol. And what was it like working with him? Uh, he is... Like European actors, uh, they, 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 for them it's a craft, and they have a certain way of uh, behaving. They, they, they don't pull uh, tantrums on the set. They're prepared. Uh, no cue cards for them. And they're, they're also very well-trained, and he's, he's a phenomenal actor. He's got so much vulnerability. When you look into those eyes, oh, I mean, absolutely. frankly, yeah, I, I was afraid to, to 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 have a scene opposite him because I was thinking, okay, I, I got to hold up next to Roddy McDowell. Yes, and he's been a, and and then the, the, the you know at the time I was you know collecting letters so I could immigrate to the United States not because I, I wanted to be a star, but because at the time the the the, the film industry hadn't. Um, had the boom that it, in Canada that it has now, and really the the work was only seasonal. There was work in the summertime, and there may be one film in the United States in, in winter. So I was gathering letters, and he wrote me this tremendous letter that I still have for immigration. But he he was so wonderful to work with. He you know a consummate actor. Um, you know they they they, they you, can't, you can't beat those those Europeans for their, their training and, and, and their um, respect for everyone that they work with, with whom they work. He also yeah, went he on to do one of my other favorite movies of the 80s, Fright Night. 
I guess oh, dealing yeah. with a gang helped them deal with vampires. Yeah. And, you know, it was brilliant casting um, because he was in Concrete Jungle. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so he, he's, a, he's a kid in Concrete Jungle. So it was whoever thought of casting that, I don't know if it was Mark Lester or the casting director, but um, my voice is, I'm, I'm coming down with a sore throat, so my voice is like kind of raspy, but I, I, don't, I, I don't know whose idea it was, but I, I just thought it was brilliant. Yes. Um, okay, you got... Uh... We've got to talk about the gang members here now. Timothy Van Patten, I thought, was fantastic in this movie. And I'm going to tell you, there's two scenes that really stand out to me. And um, one of them, I just wince when I see it because, you know, because of Stegman's pride. It's like Norris saw so much potential on this guy, like when he plays the piano. And I understand Timothy actually did that. I know. I was, I was shocked. He, he, out of nowhere... Uh, he does it himself, and you're just not used to that. You know, a- any other time you're on any other film, you know, you're used to somebody else, you know, doing it, and they just cut to their hands. And and he did that, and he also did decathlons. <laughs> he, and and um, I, I think that he, he was very unhappy doing the film, and at that point actually probably unhappy just being an actor anyway. And I, I think that we, we just because of his, his name, he was expected to go on to do that. And I, I'm so proud of him that he's gone on to direct and, and be a great director of Boardwalk Empire. But at the time, he was so embarrassed to be in that film because of what we were exposed to and how people were being treated, like the extras. And... Um, and he, he pretty much, we, you know, we, we just hung out together as, as, as pals. We both had, you know, I had a boyfriend, he had a girlfriend, and we went to Niagara Falls together. And um, I really admired him because he was so not Hollywood. He was dating a girl who was, who was a child care um, uh, preschool teacher. And um, he really had his head on. And, you know, it, it's interesting because I remember him saying, yeah, I got a call, and they want me to audition with Michelle Pfeiffer for Grease 2. I really just don't want to go on stuff like that. And... <clears throat> It's really interesting when someone's at that level that they're they're saying I I, I don't want to do this and it, it's really just a job, and but it's a job that makes them really unhappy. Just like I guess if somebody has a day job, where they're really unhappy. So I'm I don't know what he went on to film after Class of 1984 because really the next time I heard his name was in directing um, Boardwalk Empire. And I do need to send him a note saying how proud I am of him, and and he was for me the sanity for me in, the, in, in working on that, sh- that show. Is he, he related to the Van Patten that was in Rock and Roll High School? I'm trying to think. Um, of... yeah, he's from the Van Patten family. I didn't see Rock and Roll High School, but he's, he's from that Van Patten High School. I mean, <laughs> high school. Um, uh, you know, family, lineage. He's got the lineage. I'm trying to think which Van Patten that was. It was in Rock and Roll High. But, yeah, it's, was it Vincent Van Patten? I, I'm not sure. But... Um, Anyway, um, the other scene. Yeah, I think it would be Vincent Van Patten. Yeah. Yeah, he played he, because when Tim Tim was in our movie, I just thought, oh, where'd he come from? <laughs> because we all knew about Vincent and his father. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, the other scene that comes to mind too is uh, the scene where he's at his house and he's watching, of course, another Mark Lester film, Bobby Joe and the Outlaws, which I actually have not seen. But... Now I did not know that. That is news to me. What movie that was? Yeah, um, Mark Lester, actually, I think he mentions that in the commentary track. But okay. um, anyway, the scene with his mom, and there is a real social commentary there about kids coming from broken homes and and winding up on this really diseased path. Yeah, I experienced that in my own household. My um, mother was a single mother of five children that she raised herself, and she had these... Uh, you know, ideal sons, um, until they got in with the wrong crowds, and thank goodness they've straightened out now. But um, my one brother didn't make it. He died of a drug overdose. Oh, I'm sorry um, to hear that. And yeah, yeah. And so it, it, it's a real commentary also on how your kids can, um, be, you know, really fool you as to who they are. And it's one of the fears that I have now with my son. He's 14. Um, he lives in Los Angeles. <laughs> And uh, this is where I've been told, you know, that in his middle school, there's already drugs. And uh, it's all about, you can teach your kids right from wrong, which 
uh, even though my brothers got into trouble, they knew right from wrong. <laughs> um, they were probably acting out, uh, you know, and didn't have a, a father around to, you know, their, my dad, you know, came to visit twice a year because he lived in Montreal, but didn't really have a, a, a father figure to, you know, tighten the, the grip um, once they, they became teenagers. But it's something I worry about with my own son um, because, you know, this mother just, you know, Timothy Van Patten or Stedman was acting like the ideal um, child, and he actually looked like, you know, he was a victim. Like, oh, it's all their fault, and the mother believed it. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because when um, the scene where you guys are in the alley and you got um, um, Perry King and Roddy McDowell in the car, Roddy McDowell clearly has just given up on them, but Perry King is like, you know, that Stegman, I think he's got some real potential, and it's like... You know, Stegman's got so much pride. It's just like, well, like when he blows up at him, when he, when uh, uh, Norris is like, you know, where did you learn to play like that? And there's, there's so much potential, and his pride just overruled him. Yeah, yes, yeah. Or it might even not be pride. It's low self-esteem, which uh, children from divorced families. Well, that, yeah, true. Yeah. And in, and for for boys, especially with an absent father. I always saw it as low self-esteem, because what was brilliant about Timothy Van Patten's performance is he would allow vulnerability to show up every once in a while, and then he would he would shut it down with anger. But he did have vulnerability, and and it was like the Perry King Norris character could have been a father figure to him, maybe if he got to him early, but um, it was it was too late. I mean, it, 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 it's all over, and really they stay in the, after the first five years of a child's upbringing. So they, they never really get into what happened to Stedman, what happened to his dad, what, why he's like that. In fact, we, we never, other than him, we don't see the home lives of any of those, those uh, gang members. Yeah, let's talk about some of the other ba- gang members. Unfortunately, uh, Keith Knight no longer with us. I sad to hear that. I know. I I, I, was, I thought it was like an urban myth. It was a shock, and I called his agent, and she wouldn't divulge any information. So I had to go kind of through the Canadian, you know, actors to say, hey, you know, what happened? And then I find out it's brain cancer. And he played. He was shocking. in. Yeah, he was in Meatballs. And it's, what talk about two diverse roles, you know? Yeah, and he wasn't originally cast in the movie. They had another guy that was buff, and but, but who wasn't an actor. Like Keith was a, a fine and trained actor, and but um, you know not not buff, and that that actor. Uh, refused to shave his head, and I think he ha- had a power play going on. And um, was Mark Lester just said, "No, no, I want this character to shave his head," and he didn't, and he was fired. That was it. So then Keith Knight came on, and I thought, well, this is going to be interesting because here we have somebody who, 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 you know, we we know him as the kind of meatballs. Yeah. And how is he going to do this? We and he was also kind of had a very minor role in Happy Birthday to me with me. And he, he, he this just wasn't his brand. But no, it was Patsy for me for that matter. And and uh, he did a great job. He was he, you know because I, I know him knew him as such a sweet tender guy. So I was uh, very impressed with how what he used of himself to uh, become a a, a, a predator like character. Yeah, he played Barnyard. What a name for a character, huh? Yeah, yeah. Mark was always trying to think of uh, characters' names that um, related to the drug uh, uh, um, industry. Um, that's why there was Drugstore. That's why there was Patsy. Uh, Stegman was the only one who didn't. But he couldn't think of that quickly. He couldn't think up of a character's name that related to uh, the drug trade with uh, Keith, so he just said Barnyard. When uh, Keith gets into the fight with um, Norris, um, he acts. Does he acts as a, as a double, or is it him that when he picks uh, him up and flips him over his back? Is, is, was Keith that strong? I I wasn't there, so I don't know. And that's an interesting question that I I never even questioned it. I'm thinking maybe Keith what well, was doing it, but the person that that it might have been a dummy that he was lifting up. Okay, that's how I perceived it. I'm going to tell you one guy I found interesting, and I, I heard an interview with you, and this made perfect sense. Like, um, I remember Conan the Barbarian, for example, came out the same year, and Sendel Bergman, of course, was a professional dancer. 
and she played Valeria, and and you can tell in her movements that actually added to the role. And I bring this up because I I did not know Neil Clifford was a, a dancer as well. I, I did not know that either. I just thought he was um, a buff guy. <laughs> well, it's interesting because it makes sense because um, he doesn't have a lot of dialogue. But when they're chasing the uh, drug dealer, um, the one they beat up in the bathroom, they're chasing him and they're chasing him down the stairs. And Neil Clifford spirals around the banister to go down yeah. it. He, he was the real thing. Like I, I felt that whenever they got into action, like he was the one that uh, was the most powerful for real. <laughs> and, that, he, yeah. that, that he could, even though he, his stature, like he wasn't that tall or, or big, he, 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 would, he was the real thing. And um, beyond just his, you know, his acting, which was, was so good, too, with his face. But, yeah, he, he would uh, hike over everything. You know, yeah, he had a, he, and it's interesting you mentioned Sandal Bergman because um, she was in my acting class. And um, at the time, she was actually also going out with Ray Liotta, who was my acting partner. Okay. And uh, she, yeah, she was known to have the best body in Hollywood. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you because um, when um, the the climax happens, when Nora starts to turn things around on these gangsters, I, I kind of noticed when he gets into um, altercations with Fallon, who, whom Neil Clifford plays, when he's swinging the chain at him and stuff, the way he moves, I... I it makes sense that he was a dancer because it's very choreographed, but not in a way that's corny. It really, that was a fight that really flowed almost yes, smoothly. Yeah, it was a fight that really flowed. And I think that, uh, like I said, they had a really great stunt coordinator, but Neil had a natural uh, way of moving. And I did not know he's a dancer, but I th- the chain, I think, was his idea, too. Yeah, and I, I, I'm, I know he didn't have a lot of dialogue, but I always appreciated um, what he put into it. Of course, that table saw scene, that was oh, <laughs> gruesome. Oh, awful? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was awful. That was a little hard to watch. I understand the film um, landed in some trouble for that scene. So I can I could understand that. Yeah. That's what happened to me, the happy birthday to me. Uh, I, I, I died a different way. I got the axe in the head. I actually died in that movie, and then they had to take it out, or I would, it would have been an X rating. So I end up now being a survivor and just being catatonic at the end of that movie. We want you to survive. <laughs> I've always been a survivor. In all my movies, I, get, I, I, I just survive. And in fact, it's, for me, it's questionable whether I even die in class of 1984. You know what's interesting? You bring that up. And I was joking to my co-host. I said, you know what? They, they, they should revise Patsy, and they should put her in Pitch Perfect 3. She's going to sing in the Hakapalas. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. Can it's you like imagine? Too, right? <laughs> there you go. Wow. Hold on. Just a second, Emerson. That's fine. That's fine. They're, they're downstairs. They're, they're, they're... Just, just, just take it. Just take it, and Nina will come for it. My, my son just asked a question about somebody who's dropping by with some luggage that I was expecting. Um, that's a great idea, Pitch Perfect 3, and I could be Patsy singing. My, my whole thing is I've always thought that Patsy survived, and then she, she becomes uh, a school teacher herself that inspires, um, you know, the, the, you know uh, the teacher, the, the students. Yeah, did I ever think about doing that? Like, I think it would be a good idea. Yeah, it would be, but it would have to be. There was already a sequel, right, to Class of 1984? Yeah, I didn't see that. It's Class of 1999. I, I didn't see that. Um, I, I didn't see it either. Yeah. You Do you Why know how you to sing? Hmm? Do you know how to sing? I Yeah. I My first singing audition of my life was for Quincy Jones for this film called... Uh, Neil Simon's The Slugger's Wife, directed by Hal Ashby. And I not only sang three songs, they added a fourth one. I didn't know I could sing. Well, here's a question for you. My birthday is coming up in July. Could I request you sing Happy Birthday for me? Oh, absolutely. Are you a Leo? Um, July 8th. July 8th. So yeah. you're not a Leo. You're a Virgo, right? A Cancer. Cancer. That's right, Cancer. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Just tell me what time to call. No, just sing it now, early. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want me to do it now? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Greg. Happy birthday to you. There and you go. Patsy's been in redeemed. In the Spanish community down here, they say, Happy birthday to you. Cha cha cha. <laughs> <laughs> Is the, the difference, but um, that's without my voice warming up. So, but uh, yeah, that was great to be able to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'll be forty-three. Well, you know, my dad always said that life started at forty. Well, you know something? It's interesting because next time I watch class in nineteen eighty-four, I'm gonna be like, Patsy's been redeemed. She sang me happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I ran into the only uh, cast member I've run into is um, online on Facebook with uh, Stedman. And I've had to tell him that he seems so real that he scared me. <laughs> yeah, Stephen um, Emgrim. I'm going to talk about him next. Is that who you're referring to? Yeah, yeah, because he, he's on Facebook, and uh, he's moved to Vancouver, and he's, he's been quite active, and he always posts these really interesting uh, things on Facebook about musicians and their songs, and um, very interesting. I should ask him to come on here. I thought oh, he yeah. was. You, why don't you ask him? Because I, I told him, hey, when somebody's doing something for class of '84, were you, would you, you know, would you be willing? And he's, he's, you know, thumbs up. Neil Clifford, I've, I've heard, is a thumbs down. But the other person who's a thumbs up is uh, Joe Kell, who's the guy who, you know, climbs up. He, well, he's in the bathroom scene where there's. Oh, he climbs deal. up on the flag. Yeah, he's, he's a thumbs up. He does. In fact, he just directed a film and asked me to be in it, and it's on, you know, um, it's now on Redbox. But um, it's it's called Summer 11, and it's about the coming of age of um, three young girls. And um, I'm one of the mothers, but I'm a, I'm a homeless mom. Okay. So, but yeah, he's a thumbs up. He, he, he'll talk about the movie. Neil Clifford won't, huh? Well, that's what I heard. Okay. Now, you know, maybe that's urban myth, and I heard that Timothy Van Patten won't talk about it, because, you know, apparently a lot of these um, autograph shows want to have a reunion of the um, of the cast, and there's things precluding it. And I guess that's, you know, one of them. But maybe I, I could get a hold of them to say, because, you know, when I ran into Perry King, you know, he didn't want to talk about it, and I said, no, you know, no, Perry, it's this whole new movie now, this whole young generation is has uh, embraced it, and they're really into it. <laughs> and so he said, okay, maybe, maybe I'll talk about it. Well, it's interesting because... So yeah, yeah, I think he's another person that you could approach now. And, you know, initially, no, but now, yes. Well, it's interesting because I interviewed Adrienne King from Friday the 13th, and she, mm-hmm. sh- she shared a story that Betsy Palmer originally hated Friday the 13th until she became embraced by the fan base, and she just kind of... Well, that's what happened to yeah. me. I, I got embraced by the fan base, yeah. So what was... Uh, I found um, Stephen Ingram. I thought he was so funny in the movie. He added kind of a comic relief. and yeah, uh, he did. What was he like? Well, um, he never talked that much. And also, it was hard for me because I was, I used to, I was used to growing up with four brothers, and so I, I didn't uh, have any qualms about going up and talking to a guy. But um, I was pretty much an outsider there, and I don't know why whether Stefan was in character or or what. But he, I don't remember ever having a conversation with him. But I was also afraid of him because I, I thought he was the real thing, and he, I really thought he was <laughs> the real thing. So, um, but obviously not, because since then we Facebook one another. That's the beauty of Facebook, and um, he seems like a, a real sweet soul. Well, Roddy, from Mc... what I've seen him post, yeah, um, and also you know, uber intelligent. Roddy McDowell made him talk, though. <laughs> yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, oh, he did. I, I, re- I liked. I thought he was funny. Um, another person I gotta bring up. Well, Perry King. Um, Great performance, and I heard he has since embraced the film. Well, I maybe I hope maybe my words had something to say with it because he was at this autograph show, like I said, and he said he didn't really want to talk about it, and I said, I had to tell him about this fan base. Well, on the Blu-ray, there's a, a a big interview with him, and he goes through his career and whatnot. Great. Yeah, there's a yeah. Nice... This was pl- prior to the release of the, the the Blu-ray that I talked to him about it. So Peter, uh, Perry King, did he do any of his own stunts? 
you know, we were all doing our own stunts, which was uh, very scary, except for that, you know, we're, we're Perry, we're Tim Van Patten, Stegman, you know, falls to the glass. Oh, we're yeah, all doing that's our right. own stunts. In fact, one of the most terrifying moments in the movie for me was when um, Roddy McDowell was out of control and, you know, just driving at us through the street. Oh, yes, yes. Despite those really high heels I was wearing, I was running for my life because he was not a trained stunt driver, and I, I, I really feared that I was going to get hit. Yes. It was a very low-budget film, so everything, you know, uh, they, you know, they spent a lot of money on, on the, probably on the music because it's great music, and um, but everything else was way low-budget. And, of course, there was another lovely lady no, in the film. It was so low-budget yeah. that... Uh, I don't know about the the American cast, but the Canadian cast, like we we haven't been paid for our you know television and uh, releases. Oh yeah. So, yeah, and you know again, I wouldn't talk about stuff like that when I was younger because I I thought I'd done something wrong and I'll get in trouble for saying something. Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I you know I'm waiting to see if I get anything for the video. So that that's been part of the animosity, I think, too. You know, the, so. Now, what was uh, Mary Lynn Ross like? She was uh, oh, she what, executive was, she was just, producer. She was just lovely and caring. She, she was, was executive producer, and right? Producing the movie too, so she was trying to do her best at you know at. But she she was she was just so kind, and I, I ran into her at something recently, and, and she hadn't changed at all. Yeah, I saw some recent pictures of her. Is she open to talk about this movie? She seemed open to me. She didn't, you know, seem to have a. You know, because um, you get that feeling when you run into the, the people that it's, it's like you've survived a war or something. Yeah. And um, she wasn't like that. Well, it's interesting, too, because um, she talk about getting into your work, executive producer, and she's the rape victim. Yeah, <laughs> and, and the wife of the director. Oh, was she uh, Mark Lester's wife? Yeah. Gee, what great taste he has. <laughs> she was beautiful. Yeah, I don't know whether they're still together, but I know that, you know, that was his wife, yeah. Yeah, because I, I actually found her online. I, I thought, there's somebody that uh, bring this up to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's always great because everybody, you know, they had a different perspective. But, you know, I, Neil Clifford, like, you know, one of the things that was really hard for me I, I, in a memorable moment was that his wife one night was having a baby. She was in the hospital having her baby, and they wouldn't leave, let him leave the set. Oh. Yeah. You know, and, some, and, and uh, you know, you got to wonder, okay, well, why can't we reschedule just that scene so he can be there when his child is born? Yeah, it sounds to me like it was a rough set to be on. It was, it was, was probably the most difficult for me set. I had I had one two other experiences where they were really rough, but um, for different reasons. You know, this was for the way people were treated, and then other the other two films were because there were these American stars that had were all on drugs and having big big stars and having tantrums and leaving for a few days and you couldn't find them and you know that that and then the other one was uh, you know people lying to me just not telling the truth and being disappointed in what you thought the film was going to be and what it actually was. Yeah. But this one was really because of, you know, the theme was people weren't being treated well. Yeah. Now, of course, um, Michael J. Fox uh, went on to have a big career. I think he kind of owes you guys because if it wasn't for you guys, he'd never be able to face off with those hoverboard gang members in Back to the Future too, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He was Michael Fox then. And they had that horrible haircut. <laughs> oh, my God. But that was part of his brand. He played those, you know, sweet kids. I love that scene, that opening scene. You come into the classroom, and, and you sit on his lap, and you start licking the side of his head, and you grab Aaron's flute or clarinet or what she had. Thank you. Thank you. Because, again, Suck in the end of it. Anything, given anything to do. And, and so every day I had to think, okay, what can I do here? Because he says, Patsy enters a class. So one of my through lines was, how do I make everything I do sexual? Because if I can't be, if I can't be uh, a physical uh, uh, a danger, like the, the male members were, how can I be a danger? And um, 
I chose every day to think of something in my scene that would be sexual or, or perverse. You know, like when I took the, the Polaroid picture of her being raped or when I would dance up and down when somebody's getting beat up or when I used my middle finger. Um, oh, you know, yes. I mean, yes. Yeah, that was all. I thought, what can I do that's perverse? Yes. You were running down the hallway. and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those boots, by the way, if you, can, you ever remember what new shoes feel like the first week of, of school and you stop wearing them because your heel is really hurting, that's what I was experiencing the whole film. I got these new boots, and, you know, boots are very hard to break in. And that's why if you look on the poster, like I was always standing. If you look on the poster, I'm standing with my toe up or my heel up. That's because I was in pain, and I, I just couldn't, you know, I, I would either have to stand on one foot or the other because of the pain of the, the boots. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. What, what was Michael J. Fox like to work with? He was a very nice guy. He he he's, he he was he liked to uh, in, in, and I, I think because he was trying to counter his his uh, the way he looked. So he was a uh, and, and, and I bet you as soon as he became a star, he stopped doing this. But that was my interpretation. That he was trying to n- not be the way he looks. He looked so sweet and innocent, but he, he would really, you know, uh, like to have a lot of beers and, and uh, smoke a lot, which was completely the opposite of the way he looked. But I'm sure he, as soon as be- he became a star, he stopped doing that. And I'm so proud of him for what he's done with his career and his life, you know. Um, he's, he's, I'm just so proud of him. You know, it's funny. He's really an upstanding person. I heard that uh, when they're done beating him up, I I heard that he and Van Patten would like go to like jam on guitars and stuff. Is that is that the truth to that? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I think you know, I like, read that just, somewhere. You know, like jamming on your guitar is like really not something that girls get invited to, and it's one of the one of the things that is difficult. I find for me on being on sets is there's this male because it's you know primarily a, a male population. Uh, you know, amongst producers, directors, um, and the actors, is you don't get invited to a lot of stuff because you're not part of the male camaraderie. And uh, it's hard because I, I, you know, you get to know people more. Yeah, but you were the cool person in the film. <laughs> yeah, you are the cool person. But a lot of times, you know, most of the times these people also are in relationships, and so it doesn't look right or yeah. they don't want the press photographing you being with that person all the time because it, it looks you know, not like you know the, the 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 you know the press would do a spin on it. So you're often um, just excluded. Now, who did you say the fella that climbed the flagpole was? His name? Uh, Joe Kell. Joe Kell. Okay. And I, I can, I'm still in touch with him. We're still friends. We're very good friends, and I can put you in touch with him. Well, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, because I here in Fredericton, like. Um, we get the big blockbusters here, but it's like, um, I don't know how many people even know what this film is. Like, I grew up with it. I think my uncle had it in the 1980s, and it um, he was watching it on VHS, and it was at the scene where um, they're trying to stop Norris from walking down the hall, and he says, get out of my way, you know, and, and Stegman says, you know, I am the future, and blah, 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 you know? Yeah, it was really hard. We, you know, that that line, "I am the future." It was, it was hard for me at that age, in that time, to comprehend that was the future. And you know, um, it it turned out true in a lot of ways. Well, but I... even almost worse when you think of these, you know, terrorist young kids, you know, strapping bombs to themselves. It's like the the future is even worse than the way it's portrayed in um, that movie. It is. In fact, I was bullied in school. I, uh, yeah, I, I understand that. I used to have people uh, meet me out at the bus stop, and I had no idea what I'd done. And, I, you know, it's kind of like I had somebody tell me they were at the zoo one day, and uh, one of the lionesses got really, really agitated. And it turns out that uh, there was a, um, a family standing beside them, and I guess their daughter, I guess, was going through her period, and they could smell the blood. Yeah, and I think that was my issue. I think they sensed that I was intimidated. You oh, know what? Yeah. It, yeah, you know what well, I did about to it. Me once too is because uh, nobody came near me in my hometown because, in fact, people wouldn't even date me. They'd say, "You know who her brothers are." But I used to go and, and again, I used, never used to talk about this because I thought it was my fault that I did something wrong. But I got bullied 
by a group of girls where um, I had come up every summer. I used to go stay with an uncle and an aunt in northern Ontario because my mother, you know, uh, was a single mom. And when I was out of school, there was no child care. So my aunt's husband worked in the mines, and he had a friend who had a son. And he said, well, you should hang out with that group of kids. You know, you'll have some friends. And so his son took me under his wing. And at the, the last day that I was there, I was walking home, and they kind of – lived a little bit on the outskirts of town, and I got suddenly these girls surrounded me, just like in class of 1984, and they'd chosen this one girl who was going to beat me up because they thought I'd taken this guy's, this girl's boyfriend, and I, I hadn't. It was just, he was my uncle's co-worker's son, and what happened, though, they were, I ended up beating her up, <laughs> um, and it was quite surprising, but my brother Mark had taught me how to fight. So now I'm, I'm trying to teach my son how to fight. Not that I want him to be a fighter. I just want him to be able to, you know, um, defend himself. In fact, I this movie I did two years ago with Eric Roberts, um, Kathy Long, who's like the three or four time world champion in kickboxing. Um, I'm going to bring him to her to, you know, get one a couple of lessons in self defense. Yes. It, it really helps. You, you feel they don't smell that fear in you because you you know they 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 you know they can sense fear in people. So if you know how to defend yourself, then you don't you don't put out that energy, that smell. You know what my counter was? What? I, like I said, I love exotic animals, and I got myself in a position where I got my picture taken with a 10-foot Burmese python. And oh. I told a random person at school that I owned the snake, and boy, did that get around. <laughs> And since I had a thing for... So they got afraid of you? Did they get afraid of you, or did they admire you because you had this snake? Well, I went to school one day. I did my Jake the Snake Roberts. I had this empty bag, but I had full of something, and I went to school with it. And I got stares from people I didn't even know. Because they, they, they knew I liked snakes, and they didn't, uh, they didn't want to cross whether or not I was bluffing. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, the, you know, that that's probably even better, you know. <laughs> well, I tell <laughs> you, I've question. learned a lot from animals, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because yeah. Good point. You would learn a lot from animals. I've learned a, a lot. Like, I, I watch a lot of African wildlife videos, and there's sometimes the stupid things people do that cause alterations with animals, you know, and... I'll tell you, you, have, you haven't lived until you've seen an elephant move a Range Rover off a road because somebody thinks that they're going to make the elephant move. Really interesting. Oh, yeah. And yet there's such sensitive souls. Like, they, they actually, when one of their tribe are, uh, dies, they grieve. Yes, they do. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's, that's where I, I got it. And um, even so, I even had to give myself a makeover, like couple years ago because I used to wear a bandana a lot and uh, I hated having people come up to me and ask for drugs and I don't even so much as smoke yeah and I hated that and so I put up with a lot of that and so I just gave myself a a makeover and dress better and I feel more confident yeah yeah the stereotype does exist you know people do treat you the way they perceive you yes now, another thing I learned about uh, going back to class of 1984, um, um, <laughs> I think it was Mark Lester, I think, said this. The school was not impressed because when class regained, all the graffiti was still on the wall. Oh, God. Oh, I heard that, yeah. This is why I always tell people never rent out your place to a, a film crew because it will never be the same. Yeah, and, you can, know, they, People want to. They get all this money, and they think that's great, but it will never be the same. Oh, my, and that was a mess all over the walls in that school. Yeah, yeah. What school yeah, was it? It's, it's normally part of a contract that you return. Yeah. Uh, thing. Let me know, that, that's the, the classic rule in life is you learn in kindergarten, like you leave things the way you, you found it. So um, this uh, school, what school was that? That was in Toronto, was it? Yeah, it was in Toronto, yeah, and one of those older schools. I can't, I can't remember what it was called. Is it still operational, or do you know that? I, I think it's still operational. Now, if I ever go to Toronto, and, like, I never get out of New Brunswick, if I ever went to Toronto, I think, I'd want to go tour that place. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think the last time I was there, it was there. I think it's on uh, Bathurst Street, if I, can, if I recall correctly. Now, now, looking at some of your other films, now, you, um, 
were offered a part in the movie Meatballs. Is that true? Oh, no. No? I, here's what happened. Okay. Um, I And it turned out for the better because Meatballs and uh, Happy Birthday to Me were kind of uh, being cast simultaneously. Okay. And I was like, I must have been 19 or 20, and I had the casting director was Jack Bloom, actually. And I had um, just got my wisdom teeth out. And the older you are, the harder it is on you. And I was really swollen and black and blue. And But, you know, we, my, my mom encouraged me to go in that, you know, they'd understand, just go in and meet. So I went in and I met. And uh, But I really didn't look good at all. And it became, uh, you know, a joke in my family because um, when I got home, my, you know, teasing by my, my brother, as my brother Greg said to me, you know, um, they call, uh, what's his name, Vincent Price called while you're gone, and he wants you for a horror movie. <laughs> That's the way I looked. But it worked out for the better, because I wasn't available. I would, wouldn't have been available to meet J.B. Thompson for Happy Birthday to Me. So, um, with um, Meatballs, if had you done it, you would have got to work with Keith Knight twice. No, no, Keith Knight was in Happy Birthday to Me. Oh, that's right. You mentioned that. Yeah, so Sarah Torgov got my part in... in um, you know, I don't know how it would have handled that. Because uh, you, if, had you got the part in it, it would have been you and Christine DeBell, who I also think is a gorgeous woman. I don't remember her. I thought it was Cindy Gerling. Well, Christine, Christine DeBell played A.L. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, trying to get her on here for an interview as well, and uh, I've talked to her on Twitter, but she was um, uh, she was uh, one of the counselors in uh, Meatballs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she's the one, uh, if you remember, she was the one that was with the guy, and and uh, they had the potato chips out and whatnot, and she says, you know, for a jerk, you're a really nice guy. <laughs> 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 you know, yeah. But... Um, Let's talk about Happy Birthday to Me. What okay. was your experience like on that film? Oh, wonderful. J. Lee Thompson, you know, what, what I've come to know about great directors when, you know, at the time when people would say, well, what's it like to work with, like, Joe Jabbar or John Huston? And I think, oh, I have to say something because they, they really don't do anything. <laughs> but what it is, is they're so good, as, and John Huston said this, you, you want to have a successful film, get a great script, and get great actors, and just let them do their thing. And that's what Lee did. Like, he just met with us. There was no reading. He knew who was right or who was wrong for a part. He, he, and then you just did your thing, and you could see he was editing in, in, in his head the whole time. And, and you know, he, there was no hesitation ever of, of, oh, am I doing the right thing, or was that the right take? From, from his point of view, whereas, you know, other directors, you, they tamper with you. They, they're not sure whether they got the right take, you know. Um, there's a real difference. There's, there's a reason they're great directors. And he, he was one of them, and he was also very funny, very funny. And he was trying to quit smoking while he was on the set. So he would carry these, we call them twiddles, or he called them twiddles. And they're like little, you know, it was the, um, I don't know whether it was his assistant or whether it was the script person, but it was their job to tear off like a, an eighth of an inch of a eight by eight by eleven piece of paper, so that he could hold it all the time and and twist it while he was talking and directing and everything. Okay. So, <laughs> what was your experience like with Mark Lester? Um, Mark, um, what I liked about Mark was he had no ego in in that he was very collaborative in 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 working, um, and so you, whatever you suggested, he would be supportive in um, getting that for you, like getting that breakaway bottle or anything I suggested for Patsy, he would be very open to it, where, whereby there's, you know, and that, you know, that's usually difficult when the writer of the script is the director. Oh, he wrote um, it as well, did he? Yeah, he wrote it as well, yeah. Yeah. I don't know why he don't do, uh, like I said, a, a sequel to that, not like Class of 19, 1999, but... Um, I don't want to see him remake it. I'm I'm not big on people remaking films, and I don't I'm think not that, either. Yeah, yeah you know, there's very few films. Like I was just talking to an actor the other night about very few films when they're remakes. You actually like they're never better, but they're you know just as entertaining. You know, lots of times. 
um, like we were talking about the postman always rings twice that that was a you know they are both entertaining but it's it's rare that it even gets to that point that it's entertaining you know what I mean one that did work I thought the 1978 version of invasion of the body snatchers I did like that yes yes yep and I enjoyed the American remake of the girl with the dragon tattoo as well I did too, but they, I just, we were talking about that with that actor, and I was just saying the other film, like the the American remake, had that big American feel to it. Yeah. Whereas the other one, the European, was smaller and creepier on one level. It had a creep level to it. You know, it's interesting. It, yeah. But you know, great director David Fincher. Yeah. Oh, he's fantastic. Actually, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell a story about that. Okay. <laughs> I haven't told it to anybody. Oh, perfect. So this friend of mine, he does extra work, right? Okay. And he, he calls me up. He goes, Lisa. And he lives around the corner. He goes, Lisa, they need a, a, a hand double for the girl, a dragon tattoo, the David Fincher movie. And I said, Tony, come on. Just, just do it. Just, just, just do it, you know? And I said, there's like a, a million hands. And like, I'm not a hand model. He said, just do it. So he comes over with his camera. He takes, like, four pictures. We email it in. Sure enough, who gets the role of the hand? (laughs) And so, but it's kind of exciting for me because I get to see this great director. So, and this is how how great directors work. They pay attention to detail. So the scene with my hand is because the the English actress had gone back to, I'm going to turn this off. This is my cell phone ringing. Okay. Hold on. I'm sorry. That's okay. I should have done this beforehand. So, your um, hands in that film? Yeah. So wait, we go. It's beyond that. So, so this is how great directors, you know, um, pay attention to detail. So the the lead actress, that's what happened. She'd gone back to England. They didn't want to fly her back. So, the scene where my hand is is when the character has to go up to the wall and sees all the the photographs that are and, and notes that are posted to the wall. So as I'm doing that, he gives me direction for my hand. He goes, okay. So what you need to do here is you hesitate, and then you go to reach for it. So, okay, so I do that, and, but what's really wonderful, you know, and I'm keeping it in the closet because I'm thinking, okay, I'm working as a hand extra here. <laughs> so wow. then what happens is uh, I get called in a month later because they decide they want to shoot it, reshoot it. Okay. And again, you know, when they have big budgets, they can do this. And I call this back acting. Okay. Okay. Which, as a joke, once Jeffrey Tambor is in this film, he goes, "Lisa, this is my back acting," and because we're doing a scene where um, uh, there was something you know, terrifying that happened, and, we, and so I looked at him, and he goes, "This is back acting," and he and he clenched his rear end together. Oh. <laughs> but he was so funny. Anyway, this time they 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 wanted to see my full half back, so they sprayed my hair red, cause it reddish, because that was what her hair color was, and put a jacket on, a, a coat on, and everything. And this is how he, he told me how to walk and everything. And so he told any great directors talk story. So he said, so this is a scene where you come in, you're a little hesitant, not apprehensive because you don't know where you are. And, you know, and then you make this discovery. So he totally directed my back and how to, how to walk. And I thought, so what I did is I, I wrote a note to him saying, I've had this career where every time I've worked with someone for the first time, like my first acting film was acting role with Claude Chabrol. My first time singing was, you know, Quincy Jones. My first time in theater was for Des Mackinoff at the La Jolla Playhouse. I said, this is the only time I've been an extra, but it's with David Fincher. And so I gave, I gave the note to the AD, and I don't know whether it ever got to him. But he is casting an HBO movie now, so I'm thinking maybe I should write him again and say, you know... I, were, I did my hand on my back for you. Would you, you know, would you consider me <laughs> for, for a role? But yeah, I've never told anybody this because I, I, you know, I tell friends and we laugh about it. That of all the hands, and I would never have done it, but my friend calls me and says, "You've got to put your hand in this," and then my hand gets cast. Wow! Oh, gee! <laughs> and I, you're the first to hear it. Oh, in, that's in, so in great! Wow! <laughs> that is incredible. <laughs> You know, it's interesting I bring this movie up, and, and um, you know, I know some films go over the top or get too obsess- excessive with violence, and uh, like I said, I came from a Christian household, you know, but I also, like, I can look at um, disturbing content in a movie, and you can tell whether something's uh, gone too far and too not, and I'm going to tell you a little story about Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, is that mm-hmm. I had somebody tell me, that every copy of that movie should be burned because of the two rape scenes. 
and it, it, pretty pretty brutal stuff, man. And it's weird because I caught him coming out of the amazing Spider-Man at the theater, and uh, I pointed to the movie. I said, "So you're okay with the violence in this?" And I said to him, I said, to accept the violence in one of uh, these superhero movies, it's about the same as somebody assaulting somebody and saying, oh, you can't charge me because there's no blood drawn. Right. You know, like I just saw uh, Avengers Age of Ultron. Fine movie, very entertaining, but it opens in the midst of an action violent scene, and uh, it's not uh, graphic, but it kind of treats violence kind of as an entertaining plaything, whereas I think with movies like Girl with a Dragon Tattoo or uh, Class of 1984, I think the violence, I think it allows you to think about it. Yeah, it, it, it has a, it, it's not, it has a, you know, it's about story. Yeah, I, I'm finding that more and more. I went to see Entourage, and I just couldn't stand the way women were portrayed in that movie. And, the, you know, the opening is this big sex scene. And um, the only time you see women is like that. And, you know, you, you, and you, at my age, you think it's over. But I just got, I had to just turn something down because, you know, somebody said, oh, it, it, it'll be, you won't really see the nudity. It'll be implied. And I thought, oh, yes, implied through the bonfire, you know. And I, I've, you know, I, I got burnt once, so I'm not going to get burnt again. And um, it was disappointing because I just thought, you know, I really thought at my age, um, to being asked to do nudity would be over. <laughs> and it wasn't just that. It was that every female character in the movie did had some sort of nudity or said something really crass. And you just get tired. Uh, you, know, as, as, you know, when you're younger, you don't see it as much. You know, I mean, you haven't seen it as many times. You haven't been given as many scripts. But it, it wears you out artistically. It just wears you out artistically. And I always said this, you know... Um... I've got nothing against nudity if there's a point to it. Like if I don't a point to it. Yeah. Like I think, for instance, like Carrie, for example, when Sissy Spacek is nude, it's about puberty. It's, she's growing, her body's growing, and then you see Nancy Allen and P.J. Souls and Amy Irving when they're nude. It's about sexuality. So I think the nudity in the opening scene of Carrie actually there was a point to it. But yeah, yeah. But I also think too, like Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, directed, of course, one of the greatest uh, shower scenes, you know, that you don't see. Right. Yeah, like you don't see any nudity and you think you th see more than you do. It's kind of like that scene that you were talking about with the girl was shaking there in Class of 1984. Like if I was directing that scene, I might have tried to be creative and yes. imply that she's nude, but not actually show her like have her have something on her on her boobs and something and a thong on but maybe you know um have her a shot where she's sliding the straps down and then the shot where it's like dropping at her feet you know yeah and and that's also sliding the straps down it's it's more provocative exactly like um like i i had the same experience like after being burnt once i did this film called the nest okay. and there was a shower scene and i had it in my contract that i had to wear a body stocking and Sure enough, there was no body stalking on the, the set the day of my shoot. And so I just remembered Phoebe Cates talking about how she got around stuff like that is she put gaffer's tape over her, over her nipples so they would never, you know, be able to show her breasts. So that's what I decided to do. And um, we were shooting the scene, and after each take, the you know, camera operator kept saying, well, we keep seeing the tape. And I said, well, you know, if you're seeing the tape, you're seeing too much. And meanwhile, you know, I could have said, I'm not even doing this, you know, because you don't have my body stocking. So the producer, um, uh, the, the woman, the wife producer, I can't remember her name, Corman. Um, anyway, she brought me into, she came into my trailer, and she said, I hear that you're difficult to work with, that you won't do this scene. And I said, I, you know, and I said, it's not that, I, that you won't do nudity. And I said, well, it's not that I don't do it. I said, I, you know, I did it before. I said, but in this particular scene, I said, um, I'm supposed to have a body stocking, and so that's why I put on um, gaffer's tape, and they keep seeing the gaffer's tape, which means you're seeing too much. So she shut up, but um, it, it's kind of like they're constantly asking you to trust them. They, they kept saying, just take off the gaffer's tape. You know, we'll cut, a, cut around it. And it's like, no, I've, I was burnt that way before. Yeah, you can't trust that. And then, and then you, get told, you get the reputation that you're difficult to work with. Yeah. 
It's interesting you mentioned Phoebe Cates because um, a lot of people, um, and even Howard Stern has mentioned this, that scene in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Oh, man, wasn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah, she was gorgeous. And um, I know I, I know she's, um, I guess, semi-retired because, you know, she's with her family and whatnot. But I yeah. uh, loved Phoebe Cates and Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Me too. I love that whole movie. And I, I think, God, well, I wish I would have had a chance to audition for a movie like that. You know, it's interesting because that, that movie, I think, was released right around, around the time of Class of 1984. Both were in August 82. Is that correct? Um, I think probably. Right. Well, we were released in 82, probably. I'm yeah. Thinking. But uh, I love uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And, I do, too. Yeah. I, I tried to watch it with my son the, the other night, but it didn't hold his attention. Really? Yeah, I was, I was actually surprised. Please tell me he's not one of these Michael Bay kids. <laughs> I can't stand Michael Bay. <laughs> he, he, wa- he goes, and I feel left out. He goes to see all these blockbuster movies, hero movies with his dad. And um, it's, you know, it's a, a bonding that I don't have with my son because I... I just don't want to go, you know. Well, it's interesting. And if I do go, yeah. I zone out. Well, it's interesting because I didn't review um, Avengers: Age of Ultron until a month after it was released. I'm always more interested in the smaller films, like like last year when Ms. Forty Five came out on Blu-ray. Like I promoted it on here, and Class of 1984 came out on Blu-ray in April. And I like to try to introduce people to stuff they might not see that's really interesting. And it's nice to have people say like. I had somebody tell me last night that he he thought it was cool that I got the interview with Tommy Wiseau of The Room and Adrian King of Friday the 13th. And when I brought your name up, he's like, wow, you're going to interview her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he knew the, the movie, you know. That's great. Well, speaking of The Avengers, I also got to work with Patrick McNee on another movie that it seems to be, it's, it's a, I never thought it was even it finished, it was ever going to be released. It's called Transformations. And okay. again, another great consummate actor um, that was just, you know, a joy to work with. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. You were also in uh, other horror films. Uh, actually, what did Keith Knight play in Happy Birthday to Me? I meant to ask that. He had, like, a very minor role. I can't even remember. It was almost like a special business extra. I don't He was, like, just part of the school entourage. Okay. I think it's been a while since I've seen that film. Yeah, um, it's it's a it's a big uh you know, cult film too that people yes. are rediscovering. Well, I know the poster's got the guy with the it's just a good Bob skewer going through his mouth. Yeah, Matt Craven. <laughs> oh that's him. Yeah. Okay. I know that well, that's name. A dummy. That that that's actually a, a real dummy of uh Matt Craven. Okay. I, isn't he on a series or something right now? I actually don't know. I actually don't watch television. I just set my Blu-ray player up, and I just watch movies and relax, and that's what I do, you know? I, I watch a lot of documentary. I, I'm not, I, I get too frustrated watching um, series net now. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of it's a lot of that um, reality television, and I'm like, yeah. I know. Although I do like Downton Abbey, and I, I hate to admit it, because it is just like an English soap opera. Yeah. 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 You were in some other horror films, though, like uh, you were in one called Phobia, which I actually have not seen. Oh, yeah. Uh, somebody told me that's being re-released or something. I don't... Oh, no. Somebody told me it can't. Yeah, I, I, Larry LeBlanc in Canada, he's like a, you must know him, he's a, a music critic in Canada. He said it can't be re-released because there's problems in clearing the music with André Gagnon. Who is who is the the a composer? So that's why it hasn't been re-released. Wow. Yeah, I thought that was interesting information. It made me want to write Andre and say, oh, so what? What is the deal? You know, what's the what's the? Why is it? You know, <laughs> have they not paid you? <laughs> what was that that film about? Um, that was about five phobiacs and um, a controversial, which was controversial at the time, but they actually do this now, where they. They cure people's phobias by exposing them to their phobias. Okay. Yeah, and it was directed by John Houston, and it had um, uh, John Colicos, uh, 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 um, Paul Michael, Michael Blazer was the lead, and that was that was kind of his first foray into uh, features after doing Star, Star City and Hutch. 
and there was Alexandra Stewart. Um, um, I can't remember the, the the names of the David Eisner, who was an actually happy birthday to me. Um, I can't remember who the other people were, what their names were in the movie. What was your phobia in the movie? Oh, I, I had been raped, so I, oh. I had to be exposed to a rape. Yeah, yeah. That those hard to it's hard to shoot. Um, it was it was hard to shoot because I was uh, also going to school at night at university, and I had to get like a. Um, an essay in uh, for political science. I remember handing it to the uh, AD to mail it so we'd get there on time. My dad had always you know, used to always bring up to me all these actors that you know got their degrees. So I worked hard. It took me a long time. It took me you know ten years just to do my last last uh, year because I was doing one at a time. But um, I had a, somebody who worked at, in humanities at McMaster University, Pat Kelmans, and she was really helpful in, in my getting that happening um it, it was hard I, I was getting a lot of headaches because i it involved being uh, you know upset all the time or you know having complete meltdowns screaming and crying over and over again so i got i got a lot of headaches on that film how did um mary lynn ross handle her rape scene in class of 84 I, I I don't know what was going on in her mind, but she just seemed to turn it on and turn it off. Yeah, I think I heard something that the, the fellas were more uncomfortable with it than she was. Well, it is. It's 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 it is very uncomfortable having to, you know, do anything like that with an actor. Yeah. Yeah, and you had uh, Neil Clifford up there with that chain. Boy, I'm glad they stopped him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh when man. The chain came out. Yeah, that was oh. very upsetting. Yeah, it's kind of sad because, you know, she's an innocent, you know, and uh, I guess she's, her, her character is pregnant, and yeah. you, you hate to see something like that happen. Yeah. In fact, it's interesting because when um, he has his uh, fight with, um, when um, Norris fights with uh, Stegman there at the end of the film, and um, Stegman is in a position where he's begging, I almost think that... Um, she was more sympathetic towards him than he was. I felt that too, and I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, especially since, uh, well, if it wasn't for her, he probably just would have let him drop. But then again, his decision, well, he met his own consequences on his own. Yeah. Yeah. That was a highlight for that cantata. Yeah. <laughs> you were also in uh, another horror film called uh, Deadly Eyes with Rats. Yes, and again, that film has become like a cult film. When I was in Toronto a couple of years ago, there's this place called Trash Palace. Okay. And they um, had a, a, a screening of it and invited me. And um, again, that's a film that I'm you know, embracing now, but it was the film that made me move to the United States, not, not because, I, again, that I wanted to be a star, but it was because at the time, it was the only film being shot in, in Canada. In all of Canada, it was January. And I just thought, if this is the only film being shot in Canada, it's time for me to go. And so I took, you know, I had to go do a lot of back and forth for years because, you know, Canadian actors, we just don't make what American actors get. And we also don't get unemployment insurance. So I did, you know, I would make a movie up there and come down here and, you know, having have to go back when I ran out of money, and um, I, I made some big mistakes in my career. I mean, I had huge major people that you know, like the head of CEA opening his office on a Saturday morning for me. Huge people wanting to represent me, but I, I had a fear of success. I I, I was really afraid because uh, I what I'd been exposed to. Like there were so many people that came on to me that were doing drugs, and I was so young, and I didn't have like a protector down here. I didn't have a good good representation or management that took care of me. So I would just take off and follow my documentary filmmaker boyfriend around the world for eight years and thinking because it came so easy, it would still be there. And my other technique was to go back to school. Um, and so I was never available for auditions, you know, for, for big things. It was just too scary. And those rats so, were pre-CGI. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pre-CGI, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, things, you know, you, you look back, and in, in one way, you, maybe I'm happy. I mean, I, I actually had the role for Terminator. And, oh, I and, read that, yeah. Yeah, and and maybe it's a good thing it didn't work out, because my, my life would be so different, and I don't know whether I, I would like that life. 
I mean, I like to work as an actor, and and I actually would prefer to work on little indie pictures that have, you know, uh, make a comment, a social statement, because I, I watch these big blockbusters, and like I'm watching Halle Berry, and she gets into these action pictures now. She, you know, she she made it because she was an independent film where she. What was it called? Something Ball. Um, oh, Monsters Ball. Yeah, yeah, she was really good in it. But since then, she gets to be a poser. She gets to be like a James Bond girl. She, now she's in the space thing, and I, you know, I watch these actors, in, in you know, in, you know, Spider Man or whatever it is, and it, it's awful it's CGI, and you're just reacting, yeah. and then you watch these like English pictures or French pictures or even like the new Brian Wilson film, like wonderful opportunities to act, wonderful performances, wonderful story and direction and editing. And that's, I'd rather have one, you know, scene in a film like that than be in a series or have a lead in a big blockbuster. You know, it's interesting. Although although Terminator did have scenes. I mean, one of the things that I, I feel makes Jim, Cameron's movies great is they don't need only they not only appeal to the boys because they're, they're action movies but there's always a love story. And you were supposed and, to play Sarah and the character's Connor. There's always a strong woman. Yeah. And you were supposed to play Sarah Connor. Well, here's what happened. We both auditioned for uh, it. Got down to uh, Linda Hamilton and me, and I'll never forget this because my my uh, my agent actually set up back to back an audition to read for James Cameron with Michael Bean and and um, Gail Ann Hurd, who was a producer, with a with a with an episodic <laughs> where I should have been just focused. So I, I wasn't as focused, and the feedback was. The girl in her thought I had much more charisma than the other girl, but you know the the the, the role as a waitress would require someone who like I would I would have gone with Linda Hamilton myself. I thought she looked more like a waitress, uh, you know, single mom than I did at the time. I had that real you know Procter and Gamble girl next door look, but I was a good actress. So anyway, I I you know back to back with that I auditioned for you know uh, Hal Ashby and I got that film. And in the meantime, Linda Hamilton had sprained her ankle really badly, and it was, it was going to take so long to heal that they didn't want to wait. So they came back to me, and they were shooting it in Florida, and they were shooting The Slugger's Wife, the Hal Ashby film in Georgia. So they said that I could probably do both, because one, I was the lead, and one, I was supporting. And as you know, fate would have it, the uh, casting director's husband was the location manager or no, the driver captain actually on the Slugger's wife, and he looked at the master schedule and he told her, "There's no way Lisa could do both." And so um, they decided not to, to. They decided that they had to wait for Linda because I wasn't available. And I remember my agent at the t- time saying, it "Doesn't matter, Lisa. You got the better film. It's you Neil know, Simon, Hal Ashby, Ray Stark producing, Quincy Jones doing the music." And I said, no, the other film's a better film. He goes, Lisa, it's like a, a, you know, an independent film with Arnold Schwarzenegger and an unknown director. I said, it's the better film. It's a better story. <laughs> and I was right. Well, if I, I may add my two cents worth, and no offense to Linda Hamilton, I think you're cuter than she is. <laughs> well, that, that, I, that's why I think she was more right for the part of this, you know, um, um, whatchamacallit, the uh, waitress. She had more of a waitress look to her, and she had less charisma. So they needed somebody more like that. But I, now I know I could have played it. I mean, I've, I've played a homeless person now. Yeah. So I, 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 but people still don't see me playing that sort of thing. Like recently, I was up for a part, and um, uh, my manager talked to the, 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 the casting director, and he said, oh, well, Lisa's just going to be too hot for that role. And he said, well, it's just... You know, um, cool her down by letting her gain weight and dyeing her hair brown. And so he sent him the footage of me playing this homeless person. He goes, oh, she's great. And he said, well, you know, we've got him an offer out to Kathy Mori- Moriarty right now because she's now back. Okay. And if that doesn't go through, we'll see what's happening. And, you know, that's what happens. You sometimes get Kathy Moriarty, who's an Academy Award Raging winning Bowl, actress, yeah. comes onto the scene. And I'm not going to be able to compete with that. And also she... You know, she has more of a rough edge to her that was right for this uh, part than I did. Okay. You know well, what I mean? It's it's it's. And yeah, I get it. Yeah. Just said, we never get the first choice. Yeah. Somebody's not available, or they become available, and then they're not right for somebody to, to be opposite somebody we've cast, and so. Yeah. So, what was your experience like on the Slugger's Wife? I, I loved it. I, I you know I. 
I, I, uh, it, it was so great. I'd never worked on a movie where there, there, there's money for everything. I mean, you know, when they did eight takes, I thought I'd done something wrong. I, I was used to working in Canada where you, you only do a second take because there could be a hair in the, in the gate. So, you know, and, uh, it, you know, it's such a supportive environment and really, you know, in every department we had legendary people. But then when things started going awry, when they weren't happy with Rebecca's performance, um, it got very tense. And, um, you know, at one point uh, they were going to replace her and I was going to do the lead. And so they, they brought in named people, too, that had tested the first time. So they brought in, like, Daryl Hannah and... Um, Rosanna Arquette and uh, I just watched Daryl Hannah the other night in Kill Bill Volume 2 oh. <laughs> <laughs> and what was a girl in China Beach they brought her in and then for some reason because like everybody was unhappy with her I can talk about it now I didn't talk about it then um, and you know, got a hand it to Tom Cruise he, he was flying in every weekend from England while we were, where he was doing Oh, that movie with Nicole Kidman. Uh, oh, Eyes Wide Shut. No, not that. Oh movie, no, sir. not that one. Um, um, Days of Thunder. No, no, no. It, it no, that's England. not it. Um, uh, I can't remember to see Rebecca because he he'd heard things were you know in trouble with her, but for whatever reason, Ray Stark, who is, was a very powerful producer, decided he wanted to move forward with her. So they decided to reshoot everything, and that's when everybody gave up, and that's when it really was a big disappointment for me because I, I really thought, well, okay, this is, this is my big break now, you know? And, um, you know, when they were first talking about replacing her, I thought, oh, I'm not going to, I'm going to get replaced too, because there has to be like a physical resemblance for the story to work. And then, you know, the, the hairdresser who had worked on all of Ray Stark movies, she said, I'm going to tell you something, but you can't tell anybody. They're thinking of replacing Rebecca with you. So there's so many times when it's seconds and inches in your career, where you can just, it's just like a matter of a decision that would have changed your life completely. And, you know, in one way, I'm, I'm, I'm happy because um, I've, I've been able to raise my son in a, in a normal environment. In another way, I'm not because, you know, now that I want to come back to acting, there's a lot of very successful actresses because there's not, a, you know, that have TVQ, that have film um, credits, in recent film uh, um, credits that, you know, because of the economics, um, I'm, I'm behind them in the line. So, um, so it, it's very disappointing that when another, a film does come along where you get offered it, like I did last, last month, that I had to say no, because I don't like the, the content for myself or the other female actresses. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you were also in a movie called The Nest. Yes, that that's the one where the, the, I had the shower scene that I had to have the big argument with it. With uh, I can't remember her name. It's Roger Corman. I can't remember his wife's name. With her, and you know, again, if I had good representation at the time, I, I wouldn't. It wouldn't have been an issue. I wouldn't have had to have that argument. You know, they would have just said, "This is in her contract. She has such and such an agent and manager, and we don't mess with them." I just would have had you had like a, a bikini on you just shoot from the shoulders up. And if you had to do a midsection shot where you don't have the clothing in there, you can always apl- uh, imply it. I don't know why they need to go over the top with that. Like, well, it, I think, yeah, I think I think that when it's not like a John Houston or somebody, they, they go with what they can get, you know. What was John Houston like? You, you worked with him. I was intimidated by him. You know, I mean, this, this is John Houston. And he had the voice of God. And I thought, oh, my God. And, you know, he says, look, look, look who he's worked with, and I better do a good job. And But I felt better when my agent was at the, uh, the you know, Canadians call them the rushes in those days, but the, the, the dailies. And he said, Lisa, what I really like is after each take, he says, good, very good, dear. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I was afraid of him. He you did know, the he Maltese the Falcon. He was actually on uh, oxygen at the time, so he just sat yeah. there. But again, he knew exactly what he wanted. He didn't tamper with your work whatsoever. He let you do your thing. And he didn't ask for anything extra because he was editing in his head. Yeah. Well, but yeah. I did, I, there, there again, I had to go head-to-head with an, uh, you know, a, a nude scene where I, it suddenly my agent now, – now they have a ruling in Canada based on what happened to me because it wasn't in the script. She's – 
casting director call up my agent and said, well, there's going to be a flash of a breast for Lisa in this movie now. There, there's going to be a bathtub scene. And because it was John Huston, I was like just told, <laughs> they was just like expected, you know. And now they have a ruling in Canada that they have to disclose and we have to see the scene ahead of time. At the audition, we have to be told if there's nudity. But anyway, um, I had a real battle about it in my mind. And I remember going up to him and saying, well, you know, Catherine Hepburn would never do nudity. And no. he said, for me, she would. <laughs> and, you know, how do you, how do you uh, compete with that answer? So what we did is we, we had an agreement that I would shoot it. And if I didn't like the way it looked, um, it would not be in, in the movie. And so I'm probably the only person ever who had a you know, first cut, you know, uh, rights with in a John Huston movie. Yeah, he he did the Maltese Falcon, and of course he was the villain in Chinatown with that big, big bold oh, line. Yeah. The future, Mister Geddes. The future, you know. Yeah. But going back the nudity, it's like it's funny because I think. Grace Kelly was probably the most beautiful woman, gorgeous woman I can think of, and I'm, she'd never been nude on camera. Yeah, but didn't they, didn't I mean nobody was nude on camera then? And also, nope. if you notice, the leading men all had women that were their age. They didn't have women that were half their age um, as their leading women. They had the courage. Whereas now, what's her name, um, Gyllenhaal? Uh, she just got passed up for. Being the uh, romantic lead, uh, who was it? I can't remember. She didn't say who the actor was. It was an actor like in his in his sixties, you know. I don't know. I think they did that back then. I mean, Cary Grant was a lot older than a lot of the, the women he was cast off. Yeah, so, you're, yeah. You know, yeah, not not like today. Not not as not as you know. I don't think the spread was as big as today. And also, they had the um, in those days. What was it, what was it called that? Uh, committee that had to screen movies and like you couldn't have a kiss over so many seconds and and Hitchcock actually got around it in his editing and um, if there was a kiss on the bed one foot had to be on the floor I can't remember the name of the organized I can't remember was, what, what was it, was it the, the the production code or the his, yeah, yeah yeah I can't remember the name of the production code though anyway so I'm sure if they could have gotten it, they would have, because you know there, there's nudity like in old silent films and stuff like that. Yes, um, yeah. I read an article recently that talked about this very situation, and they're saying that um, um, there's a lot of older men right now in movies doing scenes with um, Jennifer Lawrence and Emma Stone. I got a big Emma Stone crush, so I'm not gonna. Yeah, gonna, I like her too. Yeah, but. Um, but I'm going to say one thing in their defense. Emma Stone and Jennifer Lawrence are both very talented. So, I mean, they're getting Oh, yeah, that they are very it. talented. But it doesn't mean that there aren't talented women that are uh, appropriately aged to be opposite these men. Exactly. And that's why what's tragic is that then these women disappear. You know, they, they play Ingenue and then DA, and then you don't see them until they're playing Miss Daisy. And then when they are playing Miss Daisy, they've had face work. So we don't ever get to see a, a real woman of, of, you know, um, of an older age on, on the screen, you know, maybe, maybe Judy Dench. You know, well, I'm or, amazed. Uh, like Meryl Streep and Helen Mirren, they still find work. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but those are only two. <laughs> yes, yes, you're that, right. That are finding, finding work. Like even Diane um, Keaton's becoming less uh, uh, seen now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so many, so many are not being seen. I mean, we're seeing older women, thank God, a little bit more in cable now because they've discovered that, you know, the boomers, they're staying home, so they're watching TV, and they're still making films for youth because they want to get out of the house. Yes. So, so tell me, are you uh, educating the folks of Los Angeles about uh, Canada? Because I can't believe how many people in the States think we live in igloos here. Well, <laughs> I, I, I try and educate them, but um, I, I heard something at my son's graduation that was very upsetting to me. Um, and this woman was talking about her social studies classes. She goes, and it was great to learn about other countries because, like Canada, that they think they're better than us because of their health care system. 
it's not that we think that we're better than them. We think our health care system is better. So I, I, I couldn't believe that that had gotten by the school and it was said out loud because I, I felt like a knife had gone through my, my heart because we, we've always been the biggest allies of the United States. We're their biggest trading partners. But the latest thing that I can't get over in Canada with this Harper government is how much they've cut everything. But this latest thing is that you can lose your Canadian citizenship if you have another another citizenship where you're not living in Canada. I can't believe that went through. Like Jim Carrey, for example? For all of us. Wow. If you're, this, it got passed with this government we have in Canada right now. That That's... if you have another citizenship or you do not live in Canada, they can take your Canadian citizenship away, even if you were born in Canada. Oh, that's not right. I, I can't believe it went through. Wow. I, I, just, I just, I'm shocked. Yeah, because I was watching Horrible Bosses. Did you ever see that movie? No. No, there was a scene in it, of course. You know the story that the three guys uh, want to kill their bosses. And it's a comedy, of course. But there's a scene where they're in deep trouble. And, of course, uh, they start talking amongst themselves. And they say, where can we go? We can either go to Mexico or Canada. And one of them speaks up and says, yeah, go to Canada. We have to learn about hockey and wear sweaters. And I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it, you mentioned uh, we're the state's biggest allies. And I'm going to tell you, I was not pleased with uh, George W. Bush's uh, attitude towards Canada because I remember when 9-11 had happened. Mm-hmm. And um, I was at work at the time. Like, this is a volunteer job here. I work at another job. But um, I remember, you know, everything just stopped at work. And, and I remember the news that night. Um, you know, p- um, Americans were stranded and, uh, at the airport. And can- can- Canadians were opening their homes to Americans. And I was a little disappointed that um, George W. Bush, I guess, um, I'm, I'm speaking secondhand here, was not pl- impressed because— uh, we wouldn't join them in going to war. And I'm like, wow, really? <laughs> yeah. Did really. I say that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I wasn't pleased about that because I think Canada is really um, a great country. I don't agree with the whole thing, uh, the citizenship thing. I I think if I don't you... believe in how they've cut the arts either. Oh, yeah, they cut the arts bad. You see, here and in... He wants to even get rid of the CBC, apparently. Oh, wow, really? They've got the CBC, yeah. You see, here in uh, Fredericton, uh, in November, we have the Silver Wave Film Festival. And for one week, the first week of November, they play um, a lot of stuff that was shot in and around here and stuff shot in Canada. And uh, it's hard to shoot a film, even even here in uh, the Fredericton area, you know, because uh, the all these budget cuts and stuff with the arts and stuff, it's hard to... Uh, because I would love to see it, uh, Silver Wave, get to the point where we can in- invite somebody like yourself to come down. We had Joe Medjuk here one year, and I didn't know he was from here. And he was... I didn't know he's from there either. I'm yeah. friends with his wife. Yeah, he, he's from here, and he was here on uh, Silver Wave um, 2002, and he played the movie Dave with Kevin Klein and Sigourney Weaver. And <laughs> he signed my uh, Stripes DVD and uh, private parts with Howard Stern, and he answered all these questions. I was like, "Wow, he's from here!" And um, and I also find it funny a lot of Canadian films they don't get really proper distribution in America. Like, d- does it? Does the American? Do they know who the Trailer Park Boys are? I'm sure you do. I do, and uh, there's a few uh, people. There's a few people that I consider very intelligent people that know. Because I find the Trailer Park Boys funny, and I've yeah. talked, yeah, and, um, you know, Corner Gas, I thought their movie was really good last year, surprisingly very clean, too, you know? And yes. Did you see the Corner Gas movie? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're really funny, but you're right, they, I mean, it's very hard, I mean, the, the studio system has, you know, the distribution locked. Yeah, and because um, the first trailer part, boys, I think was uh, the first movie was um, I think produced by Ivan Reitman, and uh, and I don't know what the distribution was for the the next two sequels, and I don't watch the trailer part, boys show. Like I said, I I don't watch television; I just watch my Blu-rays. But I watched the movie, and and um, I love it. And <laughs> but um, I find it funny when I look at some of these film review sites, you know. 
I rarely see any of these Canadian films pop up on their radar. No, I know. Yeah, like... I know. There was one... Yeah, come I up. mean, the whole world is absorbed with... That's the only thing that they're le- that's left that they're exporting is American culture. Yeah, and... Um, and I, I think I think you uh, the United States is a great country, but sometimes you got to think outside the box, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I found out that only eighty percent of Americans have their uh, passports, and so that's why they're not informed about how it can be elsewhere. That you can have better health care, and like you know, with so many other things, it doesn't have to be this way, the way it is here. But they, it, the country is so large, well, so is Canada's, but they're they're not travelers. They're not world travelers. They travel within their country or, you know, to Hawaii. Yeah. Now, um, we're going to wrap up here soon, but one thing I have to ask is, you ever go to the, the comic cons or anything like that? Uh, you know, Joseph Campbell says, if you hear something three times, pay attention. And I've been at, you're the third person asking, so I'm thinking I should, I should go. I've I never I, actually, I, I yeah. don't know how to go. I, mean, I don't know when I'm supposed to bring there or anything. I've never been to one, but I've looked online and I'd see people, you know, signing autographs and, and meeting with people, you know, um, like it's an honor, like to talk to you, but I've only met a handful of uh, celebrities in my time. Like I met Hilary Duff at a concert and I met nice. Dan. Yeah, she was very nice. And I met uh, Dan Aykroyd when he was promoting his wine here in Fredericton, you know, and I didn't he, know he had a wine thing going. Yeah, he did. And uh, I don't, I think he's. Still um, um, has ownership in a company. Don't quote me on that. But he, I remember I showed up there and he signed my Blues Brothers uh, DVD. I mean, God bless John Belushi. We miss him. But yeah, uh, yeah. Well, it's even Dan Aykroyd, we don't see on the screen anymore. Not much. I think the last time we saw him, Howard Stern interviewed him this year, and it was um, interesting because the first time that uh, Dan Aykroyd was in there. But um, I guess he was in. Uh, Tammy with Melissa McCarthy. I wasn't a big fan of that movie, but it was kind of uh, interesting to see him. Which movie was it? Tammy. Oh, yeah, I didn't see it. Yeah. Not my... Like, I like Melissa McCarthy, but that was not my favorite movie she had done. Mm-hmm. But... Um, yeah, I, I like Melissa McCarthy, but again, I just hate that, you know, when we see a woman on screen, it's like she's... It's self-deprecating. Yes. You know, that if that's the way you're going to make it, you have to either be super, super beautiful or, you know, really unattractive and self-deprecating. Yes. And I think that they... I mean, I, you know, r- truly, I, who I aspired and who I wanted to be was Jodie Foster. Oh, what a great role model. I love, yeah, great actress. I love the way she's handled her life, kept privacy. She's very smart, you know, gone, went to Yale. I, I just really like her, and I hope to still meet her one day. Yeah, I ask that. Speaking of which, um, tell tell me about some of the celebrities you have met. Have you met anybody that just made you gush? You know, frankly, uh, it was David Hemmings. I had a big crush on him on my first film. Now he was, you know, in, he bl- was in Blowout. Blow yes, Blowout. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And we would just hang out together and go to lunch and have philosophical discussions. I I, I really enjoyed him. Yeah. Oh, Blowout was a great. Or, no, yeah. it was blow blow up, blow up, isn't it? Blow up, yeah. Blow up. I'm thinking of the De Palma film, but yeah, the one where he's got the camera and he's trying to figure out uh, did he take a picture of a murder or something? And that was a that was that scene where they're they're uh, batting the tennis ball, you know, and uh, but there's no uh, ball there and they're doing the mind thing. It really underlined what the movie was about. Right, right. Speaking of De Palma, like when we were talking about the exploitation, and I remember another. Hollywood moment for me. Um, my agent at the time called me up and said he had an audition for me to do the opening scene of this Brian De Palma movie, and I would ha- be having someone drill through my chest. I'd have to have my shirt off. Well, that would be, that said, must have been body double. Yeah, and I said I I, I don't want to do that. I think it's exploited. He, he his response was, but he's a really good director. <laughs> yeah, De, pa- De Palma's ride that line, and I like a lot of his films. Like, I love Dress to Kill, and you know, Body Double, yeah, and too. Sisters, and Phantom of the Paradise, and and um, I, like uh, Dress to Kill. It was controversial for its nudity, but um, I also think, again, I think De Palma 
that opening scene with Angie Dickinson, for example, and she's, of course, it's a body double, but you see some explicit nudity. But what I found interesting is um, she's really, when it cuts after she's being, she's being uh, raped in the shower, and it cuts to her in the bed having bad sex with her husband. And she was having a rape fantasy. And I was like, and the, and the scene actually made sense because it really um, showcased what was going on in her head versus her regular, what she considered a boring life, as she told uh, Michael Caine, who was her psychiatrist in the film. Yeah, yeah. And I loved Nancy Allen in that movie. <laughs> yeah, she was great. Oh, I loved she it. She was married to De-, De Palma then. She was, yeah. I always loved that scene where she leaps over, she's running through the subway and she grabs the rails and she leaps over it. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was wearing all those, um, like the feather boas and stuff, and and she was just doing this great stunt where she leaps over that thing and hauls her legs up over it, and yeah. <laughs> but uh, I like the film, but um, I, I don't think I, I think yeah they could have toned down some stuff in it, you know. But I think they still made a just like with class of nineteen eighty four. I think they still made a really good film. Yeah, they did. Yes, they did. Yeah, they did. Film the film that I find that a lot of my. Uh, the young kids are, are embracing a Scarface. Yeah, I saw that for the first time um, on the movie screen back um, it was a couple years ago, and it was one De Palma film I hadn't seen. Very, very violent. And it's interesting because the 1932 version with Paul Mooney, directed by Howard Hawks, that was quite violent too. Interesting. Yeah. like a, I haven't seen that one. Well, that one there, there was no blood and gore in it, but for a 1932 film... It was, yeah. yeah, the censors were on it. And that was, of course, it was a Howard Hawks film. Wow. Yeah. Well, you're a real film buff, I can tell. I have been reviewing movies since 1996. And Shiloh was here. He was doing it since 97 and uh, and uh, loved doing it. And I, I used to write fiction, but I found I used to rip off the, st- <laughs> the stories I would see on television. And I'm like, why, why not just uh, review films, you know? <laughs> You know, I gushed, actually, when I met, um, I was introduced to, of course, I knew who it was, but Roger Ebert at the um, Toronto Film Festival. We just interviewed Peter Sabinski, who uh, was a film critic that knew Roger Ebert. Wow. Yeah. And and I, and he, that he actually knew who I was, I just thought, oh, wow, Roger Ebert knows who I am. Well, he gave <laughs> Class of 84 a very favorable review. Yeah, I, I don't remember that. He gave it three and a half stars out of four. Oh, Wow. Yeah, and it's getting a favorable review from me as well. I'm, I'm going to project it here tonight and watch it and Great. privacy. Great. and Great. Yeah. We're almost, Great. We've, we've been talking for two hours. Yes, we have. Yes. i got to go see my mom in the hospital. I've seen it, the incoming call coming a couple of times, so she's maybe asking where I am or maybe they have the results back. She uh, broke her hip and... Uh, and she was in a rehab, and they sent her back the other night because there was something they thought there was something wrong with her heart. So that's I got that, and my son who's had a surgery on his surgery number twenty actually on his uh, foot, which also took me off my career quite a bit because um, my son was hit by an SUV in uh, two thousand eight, and um, he's had yeah twenty surgeries to rebuild his foot, oh, wow. and that, that's been an odyssey as far as the um, American healthcare system is concerned. Because I thought I was okay because I. I had insurance. I thought the problem here was for people who didn't have insurance. I didn't know that you were in trouble and you're almost bankrupt when you do have insurance and you've had a traumatic, you know, accident. It's wind- so interesting that- you said that because my mom's in the hospital right now with a broken hip. Yeah, that's what happens when they get older. They, yeah. They, they're, they, they, you know, they're, they're, they're um, in Canada, they, they slip and fall a lot, of course, on the, on the ice, but they, they're their bones are more fragile, so they kind of just disintegrate sometimes. But and she'd been walking around. She'd been misdiagnosed and been, had been walking around with a uh, a broken hip, my mom. Your son's so. okay, though, huh? Um, it's, he, he, we'll see. Yeah, he's got some, you know, his foot, you know, um, each time is looking better. Um, it's never going to look like the other foot. That's what the doctor told him this time. Um, but he's been incredibly incredibly courageous and he's missed a lot of school and i never ever heard him complain till recently because he's not getting on a skateboard this summer as soon as he wanted to and that's really hard for a teenager when he's younger the being laid up wasn't as hard as, as it is now so 
Well, I got a couple requests I want to make of you before I, I let you go. Number okay. one, number one. Um, you know when um, your first scene in class of 1984 and, and um, Mr. Norris says, aren't you in your class? What's your name? And you say Elizabeth Taylor? Yes. I want you to say that. Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> It was kind of like my Virginia Woolf version. <laughs> oh, that was a good movie, too. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And speaking of that character, the closest I've come to playing Patsy, again, is this movie I have coming out um, in a couple months, and it's called uh, Relentless Justice with Eric Roberts. And, you know, I, I, I got the role because um, the producer wrote it for me. He was a big fan of mine. And when I got the script, I thought they'd made a mistake because – there was that nice girl next door, and then there was this other, you know, Patsy character. And, yeah, I actually called it the casting director, and I said, I, I think there's been a mistake. And he said, no, the producer wrote the role for you. So I'm going to – he sent me the screener, so I'm probably going to watch that tonight. And my other request, again, another quote. Okay, Repeat but. the line that you say to uh, Mr. Norris when he sees you in the corridors when he's chasing you down. Oh, isn't it uh, – Nor. Norris, Norris. No, hey, Mr. Norris. What is it? I think it's a, uh, hey, Mr. Norris, kissy, kissy, and then you do the kiss sound or something. Okay, yeah. Hey, Mr. Norris, kiss, kiss, kiss. <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very, very uh, um, irritating character. <laughs> the lighting was so good, though, whenever the yeah, lighting, yeah, the corridors they made, uh, the shadows and the lighting from the, the that was great, you know. The, yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see how it survives. I mean, it's interesting that that film has, from where it started, that it just has more and more respect. Yes. Well, you know, like I said, I've, I've known about this film for some 30 years, and I'm going to tell you, it's, I'm, I can't tell you just how honored I am to talk to you. Well, how honored am I that you are such a good interviewer, and, and that's the thing that, um, like, I, I was interviewed by Brian Linehan about three times, and I, what I used to love about watching him is that, you know, people would come on, and, you know, they'd been asked these questions 100,000 times, but you found some really different questions, and... Um, that's what I've heard lots of times from celebrities, that they get angry at some of the interviewers because they haven't done their homework, so they just ask the run-of-the-mill questions. Well, I'm very familiar with this movie, so uh, I didn't even write any questions down. It's just Amazing. like, yeah, like I knew what I wanted to ask and all the actors are and whatnot. And, uh, but, um, yeah, it was a real honor to talk to you. And like I said, you got my permission to put this on your YouTube channel and um, Thank you. sure, you know, um, put that on there. It and it's probably uh, going. You send me the link. Is that how I, I I put it on my? You know, as my son said, "Mom, do you want I'm me to link it to?" Native, and you're an internet immigrant. Yeah. <laughs> do you want me? How do you want me to link it to you through your Facebook page or through your manager, Mike? Or yeah, through the manager, Mike, because he can put post it on Facebook, and that would be great. Okay, yeah. it's probably going to be done in two parts because my show is an hour long on Sunday nights, so okay. um, it's probably going to get broken up in two parts. But here's what I'm going to do, though: I'm going to okay. get somebody to edit it together. Okay. So it might be a couple of weeks, but okay. I, I will make sure that I send you the interview. And um, you, you post it up there and uh, enjoy. And I hope that, uh, you know, you gain some more exposure through it. And same with the. Uh, yeah, hopefully one day. I've never been to the Maritimes. It's always been my dream and goal. So hopefully I'll get a filmer uh, out there or an episode of something. Yeah, it would be great. Well, you come through to Fredericton, New Brunswick. Come to CHSR here, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's um, this is a campus radio station, and and um, you know we would love to have you up here. Of course, um, Silverway Film Festival happening in uh, November as well. So if you ever get up this way, come and see us. I would love to meet you in person. Likewise. Yes. Okay. Well, if there's anything I can ever do for you in Los Angeles, you know, just pick up the phone. I will do so. Yeah, and if there's anybody you think I know uh, that would be interested um, that you need for your shows, let me know, and I'll, I'll put you together. You want me to uh, message you through your Facebook? 
I just through Mike. Okay, I can do that through Mike. Great. Okay, I can do that. Well, it was an honor to talk to you. I absolutely. So you know what? I don't go on Facebook very often. No, I don't either. I just started going back on just to find interviews. Because mm-hmm. after we got the Tommy Wiseau interview, I was like, who else can we talk to? And I just went back to my childhood, and I thought, Adrian King of Friday the 13th. And I thought of you from class of 1984. And I was like, it's so amazing. Like last year, if I somebody told me I was going to be talking to you, I was, <laughs> yeah. And this is a big thing for me, you know? Well, it's wonder- it's been wonderful for me, so you're a great interviewer. So I uh, keep running with the ball. Yes, absolutely. And I'll get this to you. It might be a... Um, a couple of weeks, but I'll get this to you, and I'll send it through Mike, and uh, I, I thank him once again for being so easy to work with here, and uh, again, I absolutely love you, and I love Patsy, and uh, <laughs> thank you, we, thank you, great. We, we got to get you in Pitch Perfect 3. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. There you go. Okay. Well, you take care. You and take I'm care. off to see my mother at the hospital. God bless, and I'll say a prayer for you guys tonight. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, and for my son. Okay, I bye-bye. will. Bye.